privilege to have Rob and certainly Tom uh, here, and Rob will moderate, and uh, they will have a, a kind of a fun exchange. But I want to particularly thank so many of Tom's friends and friends of mine that are here today uh, that have come a long way to uh, certainly honor Tom. So to all, all of you that I'm talking with, we appreciate you being here very much. So Rob, if you and Tom will come up uh, as I introduce you. First, I'm going to introduce Tom. Now, Tom Enders was appointed as Chief Executive Officer of EADS in May of 2012. He previously served as CEO of Airbus and did that since 2007. EADS Group is a global leader in aerospace and defense services. The EADS Group includes Airbus, Eurocopter, helicopters, Astrium, the European leader in space programs, and Cassadian, a major partner in the Eurofighter Consortium. The group employs 133,000 people at 170 locations around the world. Prior to joining the aerospace industry in 1991, Tom worked as a member of the planning staff of the German Minister of Defense. He has been president of the German Aerospace Industry Association since 2005. Tom is chairman of the Advisory Council for Aeronautics Research and Innovation in Europe. He is also a former paratrooper in the German Army and remains an avid skydiver to this day, and Tom has over 1,200 jumps. Tom likes to build aircraft, and he likes to jump out of them. Please welcome Tom Enders. Now, Rob Spingham oversees global aerospace and defense research at Credit Suisse. And I've been to their conferences, and I urge you, if you're fortunate enough to be invited, to attend. Rob does a great job. He has followed the sector since 1996 and has been recognized as a leading analyst in numerous rankings, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Institutional Investor. Prior to Credit Suisse, Rob led the aerospace and defense research at Wachovia Securities. Before entering the finance industry, Rob worked for the aviation consultancy SH&E. Please welcome Rob. Let's start with an update on EADS. Now that you've had the management handover, new corporate governance structure, and you've delved into a strategic review, which I think is ongoing, what does the future look like for EADS? Update on EADS starts with uh, correcting uh, proofs, I'm afraid. Uh, it's 140,000 employees right now. I'm saying this uh, so that everybody can see this is still a rapidly growing uh, company. Uh, since the, the creation, we have added more than 50% in terms of employees, almost tripled our, our revenues. And uh, again, if that's a matter of success, the company is developing very well. And to your answer, the future of EDS is bright. Uh, it's, it, it's growing. It's, uh, it's internationalizing. It's uh, branching out. If you see what we've done in the last five to seven years in terms, of, in terms of internationalizing the business, putting up engineering centers, production centers around the world, just the, the latest and uh, very important development uh, was the decision last year to go to Mobile, Alabama mm -hmm. and build a, a final assembly there for our successful 320 family. No, future is good. Looks good to me, Bob. Okay. We'll talk about perhaps a little bit more your internationalization strategy. Uh, over here, you mentioned uh, Mobile and uh, Airbus. You've got Astrium, Americas, uh, EADS North America has been here, and uh, you're trying to grow that business. So how, how does the U.S. fit into that strategy specifically? And maybe you could touch on the financial side of that question. Well, very importantly, Rob, I mean, uh, for a globally active uh aerospace and defense company. Obviously, the U.S. is the largest, single largest aerospace and defense market. And despite of uh, fiscal cliffs, sequestration, etc., I guess it will stay for, for many years to come. So it can't be wrong to uh, have a franchise over here, to expand activities over here, to in not just sell aircraft, but to uh, establish uh, a financial footprint. You know, what many, many people don't realize is EADS, the EADS group, is the largest customer international customer of the uh, U.S. aerospace and defense products, more than $15 billion each year. There's no customer, no government outside the U.S. that uh, is such an important customer. I think 
the calculation is uh, that we, we uh, bring jobs for about uh, a quarter million uh, of Americans. And I think that is very important. Besides that, we have 3,000 people here in the U.S. Uh, and growing. Mobile will add another 1,000 roughly to the, uh, to the workforce. We are present in 17, I think in 17 states, 30 sites. Uh, no, the U.S. is very important. And uh, if anything, we, we intend to expand our activities over here. Okay. Um, on that note, expansion. How do we think about that plan organically versus acquisitions? Your expansion in the United States. No, it's not either or, it's both. I think it has to, has to be both. We have one big advantage. We have, uh, I think, very attractive competitive platforms, rotary aircraft, fixed wing aircraft. I mean, we won some years ago under, under Ralph Crosby's leadership over there, uh, an important contract with the US Army uh, for helicopters. More than 250 helicopters have been delivered on time, on quality. Uh, we won the uh, tanker competition, at least temporarily. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and the US Air Force gave us a very important test in riding. said this is the best, most capable tanker aircraft of the world. Well, however, it was uh, taken away from us, or we, um, but the, we lost it in the second round. But that was, I think, a testament to the, to the competitiveness of our, our uh, business. We have other platforms uh, with the Coast Guard, for instance. The Coast Guard aviation is primarily EADS. And uh, that gives us possibilities, I think, if and then we have platforms, and we have plenty of those, who are not just as good as those of our competitors, but better uh, to, uh, to, to, to try to win business over here. And we will continue doing that. With regard to defense, would you say, you've mentioned the fiscal cliff, we're all trying to figure out what's going to happen over the next <coughs> week, would you say that the U.S. defense market remains as attractive to you today as it was when you first proposed the merger? Well, you know, from a European perspective, a $500 billion uh, defense budget is, is still a very, is still a very sizable budget and represents a very important market. Um, fiscal cliff, you call it over here. We have fiscal difficulties in Europe as well. Where the, the budgets are, are flat or even, uh, even shrinking. Yes, the U.S. will remain a very important uh, defense market, defense customer. And I think, uh, let me say that as, a, as an optimistic European, there is life after sequestration. Okay. And... and Speaking, speaking of that life, you, you touched on this a moment ago. You mentioned the Army, you mentioned the tanker, and so forth. When we, when we um, look at the various customers among the services in U.S. defense, so we have Air Force, uh, the Army, uh, BAE, of course, big presence there. Where would you like to focus? Where, what are the areas? Of course, all of them, I'm sure, are important. But is it Air Force? Is it Army? Can you do more in services? And I want to throw in there, do you, how about a cyber capability? Well, it's all of the buff, uh, Rob. Obviously, we are already an important uh, supplier of the U.S. Army, of the U.S. Navy in terms of uh, radars, particularly uh, the U.S. Coast Guard. I mentioned we almost got an important, we became an important supplier to the, to the U.S. Air Force, but who knows? Maybe mm -hmm. in some years we have another, another chance. Um, <clears throat> cybersecurity, I have to say that's something. Uh, we have a tiny, small cybersecurity business over in Europe. That is, uh, that is growing. Uh, that's part of our strategy review right now, to what extent we, we, we should grow in the cyber security business. Uh, but let me say very, very openly here, my priority on cyber today is to protect my own company, my own group. Mm -hmm. uh, because let's not fool ourselves. I think many of you have read the New York Times article yesterday about uh, what's going on out there. And they had a very nice list that shows uh, who's, who are the top targets. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, aerospace and, uh, and defense is the top target. And we feel that. And many companies, I think, in aerospace uh, today are under attack. And uh, this is no longer theory. So the priority is to make companies uh, safe as much as possible. Okay. But you feel like you can commercialize that once? Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. 
I think maybe we'll just switch gears. We'll go back and forth a little bit, but I, I want to switch to commercial aerospace for a minute. And <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking back to a comment that Phil Condit um, once said in an interview after he left Boeing. Uh, so this is going back some years. And he said that if he was asked, you know, what could go wrong with 787 um, uh, after the episode with A380. It was really, it was being put in that context. And... Um, he, he essentially answered by saying, whatever does go wrong, it will be something different. We won't make the same mistakes. So in that vein, you know, how do you approach your new programs now that 787 has had various issues? Um, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? And is there a cultural tendency in aerospace today, for whatever reason, um, new aircraft are more complex that we focus on avoiding this mistake and end up making that one? Well, look, I think he's, he's, he's right on that one. Obviously, um, we, we all learn from our past mistakes. We had a hard time with the 380 some years ago. Uh, Boeing is having a hard time with the 787. We tried to learn from the 787 uh, as well. Um, but we will never be in a situation where, particularly, we develop new aircraft. We can safely predict that we are not running into, in, into significant problems. Um, and our customers want us. The airlines are pushing us to introduce new technologies that uh, save fuel, that uh, reduce uh, the, the emissions of aircraft, etc. The trick is, or I think the challenge is for the industry, to keep, keep a balance uh, here. I would say that uh, after our hard learned lessons from the, from the 380 and, and watching what else is going on, uh, we are certainly less risk prone when we were some, some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you take the, the decision to re-engine the 320 family, our, our NEOs, well, that was certainly one result of that because uh, we said, uh, why, should we, why should we develop an all new aircraft? The major differentiator for some years to come will be the engines. So let's take the aircraft. There's nothing wrong with fuselage, nothing wrong with the wings, with the structure, and uh, put these new fuel-efficient engines under that. Uh, that will save the company certainly a lot of money. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say as you talk about that and understanding that in the case of the, of the NEO, um, it's driven by engine technology, what are the risk points as you see them for Airbus on the NEO? Is it with the engines? Is it elsewhere? And, and while we're at it, the A350 as well. Well, I think my, my former colleague Jim Albo once, once said, uh, with respect to the, to the re-engineering, there is, there is no simple re-engineering or risk-free uh, re-engineering, points to the fact that even if you do a so-called simple re-engineering, you have to, to, to adapt a lot of systems on the plane. We counted them once and came to something like 800. Um, so it means there is still considerable risk of, of doing that, but no comparison with, with developing all new aircraft, with new partners, new materials, new technologies, etc. And uh, I'm looking at Todd here on the on the table, and, and Kevin, our our engine, our engine partners. Uh, I don't want to be unfair, Kevin and Todd, and say you're the biggest risk on that that program. <laughs> um, but I, I say I finish that sentence at the same time knowing that their developments are running very well. And, uh, for instance, for the, for the GTF, it will be our first uh, aircraft, uh, sorry, engine on the, on the aircraft. Uh, we're only a couple of months away from flight testing the engine, so that gives a lot of comfort, and we have uh, the leap uh, right behind that. And uh, certainly I take a lot of comfort from the fact that we have two engine suppliers on that important program. Do, do you think, I thought it was interesting, your approach to this aircraft and Boeing's was, and you said this earlier, was to come in and mi minimize um, the engineering burden. You know, keep it simple to some extent. Let it be about um, greater efficiency in the power plant. Um, now, Boeing's managed to uh, introduce some cockpit upgrades. Uh, my understanding is you're either either further, you know, too far along. I don't know this question for John, but that is not what Airbus is going to do, that you're sticking with the same cockpit. And if that, for question one is, is that the case? And two, is your aircraft less risky because of that? Well, I can't say that it's uh, less risky, but uh, certainly we have focused and we do focus on what really matters, what really differentiates from the, from the previous generation. And that is 
aircraft uh, engines and all the systems that are related uh, to the engines. So it's a, what we call it, John, a minimum change approach, and uh, I think uh, that's going to pay off. Look, customers, airlines, I think have also changed their attitude in mm -hmm. recent years. I remember when the, the 787 was launched and uh, our customers were driving us to say, if it ain't carbon fiber, if it's not new technology everywhere, you know, it, uh, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't spend that much money. I think you find more and more airlines today that put the emphasis on, on reliability, deliver mm -hmm. the aircraft, please, with the, with the, uh, the qualities you have advertised at the time that uh, you have promised the aircraft, and make it reliable, operational reliability, maintainability, I think is a big, big factor. Right. And, and, and that drives us certainly towards where we can to modify existing aircraft. Uh, rather than going into right. all new developments with, with all the risks associated. Okay. I promised you an, a, a battery question, so here it is. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a lot of focus on the 787's uh, battery saga, and uh, Airbus has already made a decision to eliminate the lithium-ion battery in the A350. So a couple of questions on this. Could you walk us a little bit through the internal discussion at Airbus, how you thought this through, and, and why you came to the conclusion you came to. And does, does this give you an opportunity, the situation they have, for you to catch up a bit on the 787? And can you fly uh, the A3? Can you get to first flight on time? Well, um, how to start and how to, how to end here. Let's put it that way. We knew right from the start that uh, this was an innovation. Mm -hmm. in the industry and for, for, these, uh, for these aircraft. We identified that early on as one of the risks in the, in the development, and this is why we prepared okay. what we call a plan, plan B, okay. uh, which Airbus is now activating ahead of uh, basically two years before the deliveries, the, the entry, enter into service, and that's possible because of, we have this, this, this leeway here. Um, and we've also, in the whole design of the 350, we've been a little bit more conservative than our dear friends. Um, uh, and initially, we were yeah, partially ridiculed for that and said, you're not doing enough, you're too, uh, too shy, too risk averse, uh, et cetera. Our design of the electricity system on the 350 is certainly more, more conservative. It's a less electrical aircraft than the other guys right. uh, are, are featuring. And I don't think that's, that's necessarily a bad thing. So we are focusing on the... Um, uh, Plan B right now for those aircraft that okay. uh, are delivered to customers, but we will have a lithium-ion batteries on the on the flight test aircraft because the first flight test aircraft will will uh, will uh, take off uh, in summer this year. Right, and, and we know that they can fly with lithium-ion batteries. So, Th that being the case, um, do you have any other Plan Bs that you can share? Have a, have a plan B on the on Yeah, the what are some of the other things that you might have a plan B on? Well, certainly we have, but I'm not going to advertise them right here. <laughs> <laughs> so do you gain some ground on 787 here? And, and Well, no. I mean, our point is we have, we have more than, John has sold more than 600 of, of these aircraft. That's a pretty good customer base uh, for, for some years uh, to go. Uh, we're focusing on the final development, uh, flight testing of the mm -hmm. aircraft, certification uh, in the next months, and that, that is certainly the red-hot phase of the, um, of the program. And uh, certainly neither I nor John or Fabrice Bergier, the, the CEO of Airbus, would put our hand in the fire and say, okay, we're safe, nothing is happening. We all know that in these phases a lot of things can, can happen. You need to be flexible to, to, re to react to that. As I said, we've taken a lot of lessons, and, but Condit is right. It, you know, it's always new things that, right. that happen, or at least there are always yeah. new things. And uh, you can anticipate that only, only to a certain extent, but you can de-risk the development. You can de-risk flight testing um, uh, certainly much more than we did in the past, and this is what, what is underway at Airbus. So it sound, just to conclude on this topic, it sounds like lessons learned both at Airbus and elsewhere in the industry Maybe these airplanes today, NEO, um, and more so A350 because it's a newer airplane, <coughs> you know, clean sheet, um, have more contingency built into the plan, more cushion, 
for thing for, for so you can activate Plan Bs when you need to. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's move uh, back to defense and uh, talk about the fact that uh, you know a topic uh, that's of particular interest, especially today, um, the proposed combination with BAE, which I think to many of us was the most important single event that happened in the aerospace industry in 2012. Now, you've since overhauled uh, the ownership and governance structure of the company. You've implemented this strategic review, which I think is due in a few months. Uh, so given that backdrop, the FT resurrected the BAE merger this morning. So the better question now is, will you? Well, the FT resurrected it, but uh, I can tell you this is an academic, a nice academic article, um, but uh, there's absolutely no substance behind that. I mean, um, the, uh, the merger, I still think, was a great idea at the time. We had a, a situation where almost all stars were aligned. We found out that one star at the end was not aligned. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know... Uh, we knew it, it was going to be a very complex undertaking to align major governments amongst, uh, amongst other things. Um, but I would not have gone into this. And I know Ian King, my partner in crime, so to say, uh, for BAE, would not have gone into this, knowing that it was risky, if, if, we, if we hadn't felt confident that this was a, a good opportunity, but it was not an absolute necessity for, for both companies. In other words, so that uh, we continue to be viable, profitable um, entities. So, as, you know, the, the, the FT, that is just speculation, academic, intellectual, um, whatever you call it, uh, with, without any substance. The two companies have moved on and need to move on. After such an experience, mm -hmm. I think there's, no, uh, there's no, not much sense in looking into the rear mirror and uh, uh, looking back, but, but moving forward, that is what we're doing. We still entertain, obviously, a very close relationship with BAE mm -hmm. in both areas where we have partners, MBDA missiles, uh, fighter aircraft, particularly the Typhoon, uh, but that is it. But, if I may say, yeah. uh, the great um, fallout from that, the benefit from that was that we were able to take the, the corporate governance mm -hmm. that we had designed for the merged company and apply that to EADS only. Um, and, and, and that is certainly very beneficial. I mean, it may seem contradictory. Yes, state ownership is going up somewhat by 8%. Uh, but at the same time, these governments will have no operational influence anymore. All decisions will be taken in the board of directors. And we will have a new board of directors in a few weeks. And I'm very happy that our friend uh, and... Uh, Partner Ralph Crosby, uh, the first American in the, in the board of directors of, of EADS. That'll be a, a great new board, very international, high-profile people like, like Ralph. And that, again, makes me very optimistic as to the future of the company. When you think about the fact that you have now changed the structure a bit, you know, if we get to the point where the landscape, the political backdrop changes, wouldn't it be... Uh, logical to suggest that the value proposition is still there? I mean, what we experienced, if anything, last year was that European governments are still miles apart when it comes to something like a common uh, defense and security policy, that there's a lot of mistrust between the capitals uh, in Europe. I hate to say that as a, as a German national, but uh, that's, uh, that's the reality. And uh, that's been a valuable lesson also with respect to uh, our defense business going forward. Mm. Now, without the, um, the deal having gone through, and again, we talked about your strategic review, but is the 50-50 uh, the civil defense strategy target that you had with Vision 2020, is this still possible? I find quite interesting that our dear friends from Seattle or Chicago are, are currently advertising that... Uh, Thank God, you know, we, our defense business is shrinking, but our commercial business is, is going up. So we are not in a bad position. We have 75% and growing of our revenues in EDS group and on commercial side and 24, 25% uh, in defense. And that's a solid, uh, a solid business. So we are not in a bad position here. Okay. I want to switch back to commercial and, and maybe go a little higher level. 
uh, than the actual. High level? Little, yeah, we'll go with 30,000 feet now, maybe 35,000 feet. I'm not good at that. Well, you, you seem to like to jump at, 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 at high altitude. <laughs> So um, before 787, Boeing had this idea for the sonic cruiser, which was going to be a radical new technology, and it ended up being put to the side for a variety of reasons. What might Airbus have up its sleeve that would take us beyond a 1960s level of speed? Well, I say, with all due respect, Rob, that's a little bit polemic, 1960s. I mean, 1960s, you may say if you just look at the outward appearance, of, of the aircraft, but boy, I mean, has the industry changed? Have these aircraft changed in the last 40 years? 75% uh, fuel burn reduction, 70% uh, noise reduction, etc. Fly by wire, a lot of things, uh, a lot of good things have, have happened in the industry, and that will uh, continue. I mean, what's the focus? What's the demand right now in our societies and from the airlines, in particular? Lower the fuel burn, lower the emissions overall, uh, lower, lower the noise, make the aircraft more, you know, reliable in terms of operations, uh, improve maintenance and all that. And there's a lot of uh, technology uh, going into that in the, in the coming years in, in terms of uh, continuous upgrades or as we approach at some, at some point new generation of aircraft. We are today also very much involved in alternative fuels. Mm -hmm. We're very much involved in modern air traffic management because I think we need to look at, at things in a, in, a, in, a, in a, you're flying at 30,000 feet, so I can say that in a more global context, it's not just the aircraft. It is the system in which these aircraft operate. So air traffic management is of sure. vital importance. And we figured out some years ago, if we had a state-of-the-art air traffic management system, uh, I don't know whether the figure was global or, or Europe, uh, you could you could at least uh, reduce the fuel burn by easily by 10 percent. So there's a lot of potential here, and, and that's something, by the way, modern air traffic management over here, next gen, uh, or or in in Europe, an area by the way where we are cooperating, one of the few areas with our otherwise fierce competitor. Um, there's an area that we cannot tackle without active government support and active government action because that ball is largely in the, in the government. So are you saying court. that most of, your most of the development work and the evolution that we should anticipate over the somewhat foreseeable future, let's call it a decade or so, is going to be about reducing cost and um, improving the environmental uh, impact of aircraft rather than what I was getting at, which is faster speeds, or some kind of a more uh, revolutionary change in the technology. Yes, and you will also find that over the last 10 years, 20 years, whatever you take, I mean, safety has improved tremendously. Air transportation is the safest mode uh, to, to, uh, to travel today. Certainly, we're doing research also beyond, let's say, 2030, uh, mm -hmm. above or beyond, beyond the uh, horizon, but, but clearly the focus uh, is not on speed. It does not seem that the airline industry overall nor our societies are focusing on speed. Right. They are focusing on reducing cost and environmental impact, okay. and I think rightly so. Okay. As we, as we talk about this from a global perspective, we have new entrants. And uh, some of those, uh, like those in China, have captive markets. So it seems Airbus's strategy has been to establish in-country manufacturing joint ventures in the past, but now some of these nations aspire to compete as primes in the industry. So to, to just boil it down to a question, how worried, about, how worried are you about COMAC, for example, and their ability to integrate Western components into a competitive airplane? Well, in other parts of the world, we have also a lot of intelligent people, and that's certainly the Chinese have the intelligent people and the, the resources, the money, to put into that to become a, a, a first-class uh, player in aeronautics and in space. Imagine their space program. I mean, what they're doing in space today is at least something that the Europeans have never achieved on, on, on their own. So, uh, yes, there will be these competitors, and, and China is certainly a safe bet. Uh, the question is when. Uh, probably not in the next 10 years, but uh, in 15, 20 years, uh, I think we will feel the impact of, uh, of Chinese competition. Um, 
our, our strategy is not to avoid cooperation with the Chinese or others. Um, our strategy is to, to cooperate, at the same time protect what needs to be protected as much as, as, much as we can, and, uh, and seek a place in the markets of these uh, big uh, potential customers or big markets like, like China, same in the US, uh, by the way, at the same time as a truly global company to tap the best talent. That is so important. We should not forget the, the people factor. <clears throat> And particularly in our industry, and again, we learned that hard way, uh, tell you stories about, you know, our pre-80 dark days, et cetera, when we needed to understand that, that the quantity wasn't quality, but we have a lot of intelligent people and growing, not just in the United States and in Europe, as has been the case historically, but in all other parts of the world, particularly in China, India, Russia, South America, and, and this is not just about manufacturing, which is, this is also having access to the best and brightest around the world. You, you know, that leads beautifully into the next question, which is about socioeconomic development and what this industry, what the aerospace industry, what role it can play into turning things around globally. Well, I think, Rob, we have all recognized in recent years that we cannot just rely on, on governments, on schools, on universities to supply those precious human resources to our companies, that we need to get involved, that we, we need to be active, that we need to go to schools, that we certainly need to uh, convince people at, at, at universities that we um, have to do not just marketing, but involve people also at the local level more, more thoroughly. Um, socioeconomic, I mean, Bruce gave me this veterans button here. It just reminds me that uh, we employ a lot of veterans in the United States. Our Mississippi plant, I think it's more than 50 or 53 percent. In, in Texas, it's, it's, it's 30 percent. Uh, this is an important source, uh, of important human resource that we, that we need to tap. And uh, the human factor overall, I, I have to say, I spend a very significant portion of my time on, uh, on, on work with universities, with schools, um, with uh, younger engineers, uh, etc., because I think that is very, very important. Without that resource, and again, not just in Europe, internationally, without that resource, the future looks bleak. And we have today, other than in the 50s or 60s, a lot of other fascinating industries out there where the young people can perhaps make uh, money faster than in, in, in aeronautics, so we are in the competition here, and uh, we need to assert ourselves. Otherwise, our future will be not as good as it, as it should be, because we're still a very young industry, right? Right. Do you feel like it's difficult to attract uh, engineering talent into this business today? Well, not if we, if we start early. And we start early, I really mean work at schools. And not just that uh, doing marketing sessions at universities and, hey, wouldn't you be interested? You know, these guys at universities have basically decided already what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a, there's a lot of competition out there. And but I think it's a realization. It would be interesting to run a poll here in this, in the, in this room. It's a realization that, that we all share. That was probably not there that much 10 years ago, uh, but is, is, is very present nowadays. Historically, the aftermarket component suppliers have earned a superior return in the commercial aerospace business. Does Airbus have an explicit aftermarket parts strategy, and if so, what is it? Oh, we certainly, we, we certainly have, and we have an alternative. We have something like 350 customers uh, out there. Our product support and, and, and services business is now business way beyond uh, 1 billion uh, revenues, but I'd say we do not think <clears throat> we are best place to, to do work in the um, uh, low salary, low value added area. We're doing a lot in terms of spare distribution, in terms of training, etc. all those things, adaptations of our right. aircraft, continuous adaptations of our aircraft. Just the latest is the, the winglets that we're going to put on the, not just the new production aircraft, 320 aircraft, but also on the, on the older ones. Um, so that is our strategy, stay close to the product, do high value added uh, work, work that is important to the customer, to, to improve the customer relationship, 
And I think that is, uh, uh, that's a good strategy for a company like ours. Now, in, in that vein, we were looking at some of the data. You know, we have record demand for new aircraft. And this has been dr you know, driven by uh, global growth in travel. It's been driven by high fuel prices. So replacement demand is up. And when we look at the data, the average age of the fleet has gone from something like 15, 16 years to 12 over the last five, six years. So it seems that the useful, it, it's possible here that the useful life of an aircraft is shrinking. And there are a lot of consequences to that. Do you think this might force some of your suppliers who live off of the aftermarket to rethink their business model and possibly try to get more at the original equipment end? I'm looking at John here. At least I'm not, I'm not aware of, 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 of any of that so far. I mean, let's just say to the contrary, when we launched the, the NEO with uh, something like uh, forecast or at least 4,000 aircraft, uh, overall we were able to, may I say, reduce the prices of the suppliers because it was uh, clear that there was such a huge, uh, a huge market out there. Right. So uh, not felt yet. Not felt yet. Okay. But I think what is very important is that uh, we get a more, um, more efficient, more financially resilient customer. Uh, you might say that, uh, okay, they may, t may take uh, less aircraft, they may cancel some aircraft, etc. This is all possible, but, but what is important for us, what is important for John here, when he looks at his backlog, is that he has uh, first-rate uh, customers. And certainly, if this, this consolidation is not something theoretical. It's not, it's not something that comes by political decree, but it comes because the industry needs it. And the industry needs to build more profitable, more financially resilient airlines. And I would very much hope, by the way, after the, the, the big consolidations we've seen now in the U.S., that <clears throat> at some point also the barriers to transatlantic uh, consolidation will be removed. I'm talking about the need for Open Skies 2 or something, because we still have these barriers, only minority participation and, and stuff like that. And in the, in the, in the climate right now, everybody on both sides of the Atlantic is very positive about transatlantic free trade agreement. Um, uh, hopefully that is a, a, a possibility or an element of that. So. That is something I think the industry globally and certainly in a transatlantic context, context would, would, would also appreciate. Well, thank you, Tom and Rob. Thank you. That's fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. So if you'll, if you'll both join me here, Tom, uh, we'd like to have you have this momentum. of this very special day, and it states, presented to Thomas Enders, in grateful appreciation for your participation in our luncheon series of CEOs, the Wings Club, February 2013. And thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And if you'll stay for the, uh, And Rob, for you, we have a Congressional Medal of Honor coin. Now, these were minted last year. They're no longer available and we hope you enjoy it.